it's really kind of marvelous and, and we're really appreciative that uh, Brian and Carrie could be with us today. And uh, they're going to take us through a little bit of, time of uh, kind of discussion and then we're going to have an experiential experience after, after the break. So, Brian and Carrie, thank you for coming. Here, we're really excited to present. Is that like too crackly if I'm holding this? It's okay? All right. Um, sorry, I, I wander when I talk. Um, I'm really excited that you guys are here, and I'm really excited that, that we were able to sort of present this information. And um, this is kind of a topic that I think not a lot of people think about. As uh, John said, Carrie and I both work in the medical cannabis world. So Carrie prescribes it for her patients or recommends it for her patients. I run a dispensary and I work with a company and with their clinical director. And um, uh, when Carrie and I met and we started talking about cannabis and the success we were having with our patients and the different products that are available and all that sort of stuff, we quickly realized that we also had a very um, deep interest in the intelligence of this plant. And we started a conversation that led to a second conversation that led to a third one that led to me calling John and say, hey, I think I have something that you know, your audience would be interested in. And when I first told him that, you know, the medical cannabis 101 thing, he was like, yeah. And then I said, did you know that man and cannabis have co-evolved and that neither species would be where they are today without the influence of the other. And he went, mm hmm? And that is how this all sort of came about. So this is a presentation that um, I will tell you is, um, is evolving as well. There's new information that's constantly coming out. And, um, and so this is a bit of a, a, an experiment for us that we're really honored that you guys are willing to be part of as well. And um, I, I hope you guys enjoy it, and I hope you get you know, something from it. Um, a couple questions before we get started, if I could. And we're going to you know, sort of do introductions and talk about how we both came to practice the practices that we do, coming from our, our different medical backgrounds. And, and we're going to talk about a lot about cannabis and, and that whole thing. But I have a, a couple questions. First of all, how many people in here have heard me do a talk before? I recognize a couple of faces. OK. Um, Here's the more important question. Who in here uses cannabis? Like it. Carrie, you can raise your hand. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate your, your willingness to, to be brave in, in admitting that. Uh, and I suspect there's more of you than actually raise your hand. Um, so I'm not sure what the state is. I don't think that uh, there's medical use in West Virginia yet. There certainly is in Maryland. There is in Pennsylvania. And we believe that this is a wave of the future, as John said. This is, you know, there's a trend happening here, and it's it's my personal belief that probably before the next presidential election, the FDA will change how they look at cannabis. It will become available throughout the country. Right now, I think it's 36 or 38 states that have some form of of cannabis legislation that allows people to use it. And one of the things that we're going to make sure that we sort of um, emphasize today is what we believe is the result of this 80 or 90 year prohibition that we've all been sort of exposed to. And the results of our health and our evolving as part of that as well. So, So let's start out with a little introduction. Um, ladies first, Carrie, you want to talk a little bit about how you came to practice with cannabis leader? I would love to. Um, so I'm an osteopathic physician. And is anybody familiar with 
osteopathic physicians. I think there is a school here in West Virginia. Um, so we're, we're a little bit different um, philosophically and historically, you know, a couple hundred years ago. There was a real distinction in the way medicine was practiced and there were really two different approaches. Um, A.T. Still was uh, one of the founder of osteopathic medicine and he really believed that the human body needed to be treated as, as a, a, whole, a whole being and that structure and function were intimately related and that the mind and body and spirit also needed to be attended to in order to maintain health. So he created an entirely different field of medicine and started training doctors that not only attended to all the other uh, health situations and health conditions, but also had extra training and extra attention on the mind-body connection, on certain types of hands-on manipulations of uh, the musculoskeletal system, and ways to really attain balance um, in the human body. So that, that really, those two um, specialties, the MD world and the DO world kind of evolved in parallel uh, over you know, the last couple of centuries. Nowadays, unfortunately, that has become very distilled, the DO approach. You know, some of you may have DOs, and, um, and there are a few DOs around that still do osteopathic manipulation and kind of have that holistic approach. But a lot of us, uh, we go through the same training and the same residencies and fellowships as our allopathic counterparts. So largely nowadays, there's not a whole lot of difference practically. But I'm very proud to be a DO, and I chose to become a DO because of that attention to the holistic approach to care. Um, I also chose um, specialties that really ultimately ended up with me taking care of very sick and very complexly ill patients. Um, I, I work in an ICU, and I also do hospice work. So I'm definitely not at the fringe of medicine. I'm kind of really up to my eyeballs in the sickest patients out there. And I've watched the struggles. I've seen how our modern treatments have been extremely helpful and extremely effective. But I've also seen the shortcomings of even our most advanced pharmaceuticals and our uh, most advanced technologies in helping people achieve wellness and balance and a good quality of life no matter where they are in their lifespan or in their disease trajectory. So when cannabis started to come back on the radar, I watched it very closely as it was um, growing and becoming more uh, accessible in other states. And I was watching very closely which, which types of people were getting benefit from it. And what was remarkable to me is that, you know, what is conceivably the most frail and vulnerable populations were the ones having the most benefit. So children with refractory forms of epilepsy or people with extremely <coughs> refractory cancers were seeing results and responses, maybe not necessarily cures, but profound reduction in their symptoms and profound improvement in their quality of life. So that really got my attention and I committed myself to becoming an expert in cannabis. And I also did that um, through my own personal journey. And I had to really take a close look at my, uh, my attention on my health and how I was taking care of myself as a physician in the middle of a whole lot of a stressful environment and all the things we deal with every day and how to really be the best in the best health and be the best physician I could be. So I began my own journey in using cannabis and trying to incorporate that into my own health regimen. And so anything I recommend to my patients, I've also really uh, taken very personally and um, it's been a, a blessing for me in my life. So I, I began to really be interested in applying it to my patients. So my hospice patients really became the first group that I began using cannabis with on a regular basis. And, you know, we will probably, I'll save some of the stories for our talk and the content of our talk, but I've, I've seen some, you know, what I would consider true miracles. And while, uh, you know, people, people tend to think of cure as the ultimate miracle, there are a lot of miracles that happen through the course of someone's illness and, you know, allowing someone to spend their final days in the comfort of their home, conscious and lucid and eating as opposed to sedated and 
and unable to communicate really struck a chord with me. So um, I, I gained a lot of experience um, with cannabis in that way, and I am a very passionate advocate for medical cannabis patients, and I have my own practice now, uh, so I can expand this and have people um, of all walks of life come who are interested in cannabis, wondering if cannabis will help them, uh, can come to me and I will gladly help and certify and guide you in your journey because I think that's where we need to head in terms of medicine, modern medicine, and understanding how to work with this new specialty. So that's that's medically why I'm here and you know obviously being um, tuned into the mind-body connection is something that connected Brian and I and you know those of you who raised your hands saying that you yes, you are cannabis users, certainly I'm sure have experienced from and or benefited from some of the more cerebral and what we call psychoactive effects of cannabis. And so we then started to really think more deeply about the unseen and unmeasurable impact of cannabis on our culture and on our species. So that's really how this was born and um, we're really excited to be here to talk about it. Thanks, Karen. Um, so uh, I'm a traditionally trained pharmacist. I used to own two stores at one time in downtown Baltimore, and so I used to do that thing that pharmacists do, which is stand behind the counter and count poor lick stick typing bright, we say. And after I had been in my practice for about 10 years, I wanted to evaluate how well I was helping my patients. And so I took one category of patients, and what I chose were my blood pressure patients. And I said, okay, I've been giving these patients medicines for their blood pressure for 10 years now. Are they better? And I had to really sit down and think about it because when I started this practice, this mental exercise for myself, I thought, yeah, I'm going to say yes, of course they're better and I'm going to just, you know, go on in my career and end up owning stores and, you know, making a million dollars or whatever. But surprisingly, the answer that I got was a little bit different because what I came to realize is, is that the medicines that those people were taking for blood pressure was controlling the blood pressure, but it was not fixing the problem. And if they stopped taking that medicine, the blood pressure would jack back up. And in fact, what happens with blood pressure typically is that you start on one medicine and it controls the blood pressure for a while. And then the blood pressure starts to go back up, and then you have to have a higher dose, and then you have to have a second or a third medicine added, and this goes on for the rest of your life. I see some heads nodding like that's the experience that people have had. And so in our medical training, we're taught that that's a, um, a worsening condition. And that's not true at all. See, what we're doing with the medicine is not fixing anything. What we're doing is turning the volume down on the body, trying to tell you that something's not right. And the body in its wisdom will eventually say, uh-uh, you're not listening to me, and it'll just turn the volume up again. And then we'll jack up the dosage or add another medicine, we'll turn the volume down, and like I said, we can play that for the rest of our lives. And so here's the analogy I use. If you're driving around in your car and you see that little red oil light on the dashboard light up, you have a couple choices. You can take it to the mechanic and find out what's wrong and get it fixed, or if you want, just take a piece of black tape and put it over the light and you don't see it anymore. That's what we do in medicine for all of the chronic diseases of aging. We're not fixing anything. All we're doing is turning down volume. Now, I'm not making a value judgment about that. It's not healthy to walk around with elevated blood pressure. But we're not really getting to the root of what the problem was. And so this happened 25 years ago that I came to realize that. And at that point, I said, you know what? I don't want to be part of that world anymore. I sold my pharmacies. I opened up an herbal nutritional practice, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, center and started doing counseling with people to try to get to the roots of what the problems were. At the same time, I started a radio show, which was called Your Prescription for Health, where we explored these topics on, on air. And um, uh, I found it very uh, rewarding and very different than what I was taught to do in my, you know, in, in my medical training in pharmacy school. And then about three, three and a half years ago, I got a call from a guy. He's the CEO of the company that I work for. And he comes from the pharmacy world. He used to own a chain of pharmacies, which was called Neighbor Care, which was in the Baltimore area, Baltimore, Washington area. And I had known him because his store was right down, his first store was right down the street from my store in downtown Baltimore. And so 
He's the kind of guy, if he calls you up and says, hey, come have breakfast with me, you go have breakfast with him. And so I didn't know what he wanted to talk about. And when we sat down, he said, look, I'm starting this cannabis company, and I want you to uh, consult with us about the idea of adding cannabis to the toolbox of wellness, because he knew I was the herbal nutritional guy. And my first reaction was the same kind of thing that John talked about. And I said, oh, wait a second. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. This is a medicine. This can't be good for you. This is a gateway drug. And people that, you know, that smoke weed, you know, they're going to be heroin addicts next week. And um, and he said, yeah, yeah, I know that. But just do a little research, and then let's have another conversation. And so I did do some research, and there were two specific things that really got me to turn my head around and say, wait a second. There's something here that needs to be paid attention to. And we'll talk about what those two things were, as well as everything else that's going on in the body in relation to cannabis and how it works in the body. So I did that research, I found those things out, that really turned my head around, then I really started doing research, and before you know it, I'm working for this company in helping people um, use cannabis in a guided way. Now, um, you'll notice that Carrie and I refer to this medicine as cannabis. And we do that um, very intentionally. We do that throughout our industry. And the reason is, is that if I say weed or pot or marijuana, it has a certain connotation already. And oftentimes that's a negative connotation. And what we're trying to do is kind of change the, uh, the conversation into realizing that this is a usable medicine today. And it has been since probably the dawn of time. That's part of what we're going to talk about as well. Um, also want to let you know that this is going to be experiential for you guys also. We're going to do two um, practices or processes here. We're going to talk a little bit about this um, system of receptor sites throughout the body that's called the endocannabinoid system. And, um, and then Carrie is going, to, um, is going to lead a practice where energetically we're going to activate your endocannabinoid system. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to sit there and get high or stoned. What it means is that we're going to um, take a very important set of receptor sites within your body and um, help them become more active. And you will definitely feel something from that. That might be energy. It might be a, a mood shift. Uh, it might be a, a difference in whatever else you're feeling, whether that's pain or anxiety. You might find that you sleep better tonight. Then we're gonna take a break, we're gonna do that, we're gonna take a little break, let everybody kind of integrate that. Then we're gonna start talking about more of the, the plant consciousness aspect of this talk. And um, we're gonna take you through again a, a process and then uh, Carrie's gonna lead us in a guided meditation where we're gonna go from the dawn of time up through today and into the future in that relationship between man and cannabis. <clears throat> Sound good? Yeah. yeah. We also uh, like, participation from you guys? What were you going to say? I was going to say, just another Saturday afternoon? Yeah, all right. Traveling yeah. from the dawn of time to yeah, the future. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Are we ready? Hopefully, yes, yeah, so I'm ready. Okay. Just hit the space bar. All right, good. So, as it turns out, there is a system of receptor sites that's in your body that's called the endocannabinoid system. Who here has heard of it? other than the fact that I just said it two minutes ago. All right, good. Well, I'll tell you what. When I first learned about this, I had never heard about it. Now, I figured, you know what, I'm an old fart. I went to pharmacy school in the 80s. We probably just didn't know about this stuff. But a year ago, I did a lecture to the third year pharmacy students in school, and I asked that same question. Who's heard of the endocannabinoid system? Three people raised their hand. So. From a medical perspective, you guys are much more advanced than students that are in medical training right now, and that is a good thing, I think. So this is a set of receptor sites that goes throughout your body, and, and uh, we'll explain where they are and what they do, but first I just want to explain to you how receptor sites work in the body, because this is really important to understand as a basis. So a receptor site is like a lock and a chemical that can interact with that receptor site is like the perfect key that fits into it exactly, just like it, you know, it is up there on the, uh, your left part of the, of the thing. And so when that chemical hits the receptor site, it will instruct that cell to behave in a certain way. Maybe it causes the release of a chemical or the creation of a chemical or the blocking of a chemical. 
Um, and so the important point here is that if you have a receptor site, then you have the ability to make the chemical that fits into that receptor site. So you have receptors on certain cells in your brain that Valium as a chemical fits in perfectly. And when it fits into that receptor site, it instructs that cell to release a chemical which is called GABA, G-A-B-A. -A. And that is the, um, you can think of that as the, um, okay? We can think of that as the, uh, uh, on the brakes of the runaway train of thoughts. And so you take a Valium and 20 minutes later you go, ah, right? Well, the kicker here, oh, the kicker here is that God did not create that receptor site just waiting for Hoffman LaRoche to invent the chemical that would fit in it. If you have the receptor site, you have the ability to make the chemical that goes in it. And the chemical that would fit in that same receptor site are called endorphins. So anytime you see the word endo in medicine, it means your body makes it. And so you have this set of receptors and you also have the ability to make chemicals that fit into those receptors. So you really don't need cannabis. You can just make your own cannabinoids, your endocannabinoids, and hit those receptor sites and live happily, happily ever after. However, there's a lot of reasons why we don't make enough of those chemicals ourselves, and we'll talk about that a little bit, and then how we can get those chemicals. So, a um, little history lesson. THC was discovered in the mid-1960s. It was a uh, researcher from Israel named uh, Raphael Mashola. And uh, when he uh, discovered THC and what it does, um, we, we know the result of that, and that's the chemical that's in cannabis that can give you that euphoric feeling, right? It can make you, um, well, we don't like to use the term high in the medical world, but that's what we're talking about. High. Um, it wasn't until the 1980s that we discovered the receptor site that THC fits into and this whole endocannabinoid system. And so at that, at that time, it was like, oh, that's the receptor. Now you'll see up there that there's actually two receptors that are delineated. There's CB1 and CB2. And CB1 is more centrally located, the uh, central nervous system in the brain, and CB2 uh, receptors are more around the body, uh, organs on the surface of the body, your skin, and also plays a role with your immune function, glands. And uh, certain cannabinoids will hit into certain receptor sites different. And I know that this is only the very beginning of the story. We are in the infancy of understanding cannabis as a medicine. And, um, and the reason I know that is because there's another cannabinoid that you guys have heard about called CBD, right? And there's a table back there with somebody that has a, a CBD product. Well, CBD does not interact with either one of those receptor sites. And so I know for sure that there are dozens of other receptor sites. And we'll learn more about those things um, as time goes on. And five years from now when we have this talk, we're gonna know so much more. Part of the reason that we don't know a lot, at least here in this country, is that because of the prohibition on cannabis, uh, research on cannabis has been really um, sort of truncated as well. Uh, if you are a, a company that wants to do research and, um, and you want to do, or, or an organization, a hospital or you know, whatever, um, and you want to do research, first of all, you have to apply to the government to be able to do it, and then you have to get the weed from them. And the government has a farm, I think it's in Louisiana or somewhere down there, um, where they grow cannabis, and as it turns out, the government isn't really good at growing weed, and so it's not high quality weed, and so even the studies that are done with that product are not really helpful from a, you know, from a, a scientific perspective. I just want to make sure I'm hitting all my points here before we go on. So what were the two things that really got me to turn my head around and start to take this idea seriously? Two things. Number one, this is an ancient system. The endocannabinoid system uh, uh, evolved in creatures about 600 million years ago, about the same time that opioid receptors started to show up. And it's in life forms, uh, you know, uh, vertebrates and invertebrates, down the mollusks. And, and, um, uh, 
And so, to me, that spoke to evolution. That spoke to a really important reason why this developed. Fact number two, people that have a higher density of endocannabinoid receptors live longer. The more of those receptors you have, the longer you tend to live. And so, when uh, earlier uh, this afternoon, John and Carrie and I were having a conversation, and he was talking about how people really should be able to live to 140 years to, you know, to live out that potential. I can tell you that this endocannabinoid system is a key part of the ability to be able to do that. So um, these, this system of receptor sites is responsible for regulating a ton of different physiological functions in the body, like movement, mood, memory, appetite, sleep, pain response, the stress response, immune function, reproductive function, energy metabolism, that means how your body uses sugar. Um, uh, embryology and development. ECS receptors are found within a couple of days of fertilization of an egg. And interestingly enough, breast milk is a potent source of endocannabinoids. It's important for, um, for you know, us little ones to grow properly. Recently, the NIH reported that the ECS, the endocannabinoid system, is involved in essentially all human disease states. And we're still not learning about it in our medical training. Did you learn about it in, in your medical school? It has also been shown that, uh, uh, I told you a little over. Um, so what's this system all about? Why did we evolve this system? It has to do, has to do with the term that, you know, that we learned about the very first day of pharmacy school that's called homeostasis. And homeostasis is the concept that the body will adjust the internal environment based on its experience in the, outer, uh, in the external environment. And so what that means is that um, the body will make adjustments to continue life. And this endocannabinoid system, this system of receptor sites, is designed to return function to normal. That's why um, cannabis can seem like somewhat of a miracle cure. And you're, you'll hear people talk about cannabis being you know, used for, for pain, for seizures, for Parkinson's, for uh, immune dysfunction and cancer and autoimmune diseases, which is really interesting because with an autoimmune disease, the immune system is overactive. With cancer, the immune system is underactive. And cannabis can treat both of those. Why? Because it's not really treating each one of those things individually. It's normalizing function. That's the important thing to understand about this system. It's about homeostasis. Um, the other thing I always just like to mention is that uh, there's a part of the brain that controls respiration, and there really aren't ECS receptors in that part. You cannot overdose from cannabis. No one has ever died from an overdose of cannabis. Now, that's not to say that someone hasn't gotten really high and then jumped off a bridge because they thought they could fly and found out that they couldn't. But from the actual chemical, you cannot overdose. It's very, very safe. And that also will play a role in combining that with other medicines because I can tell you practically, and I know Carrie has had this experience as well, I have had dozens of patients of mine get off of their opioids using cannabis. And, um, and they do that using it in combination at first, and it's very, very safe to be able to do that. And just to add to that, you know, um, John referred to the concern that cannabis is a gateway drug, where in truth, what we're actually calling cannabis is an exit drug. It's it, people who are incorporating cannabis and cannabinoids into their health care are having the ability to come off their long-term chronic medications, they're seeing their health improve. And also, there's a lot of interest in cannabis as a means of harm reduction and an exit strategy from certain types of substance abuse. So, you know, that those social and cultural taboos are really, you know, we're, we're over it. We've got to get past it because people are self-reporting that um, while they're using cannabis, that they're losing interest in their substances of abuse and perhaps even seeing some physical, you know, recovery from those things. Just so I'm clear, as you're talking, are you talking, when you say um, uh, cannabis, are you talking CBDs and THC? I'm talking about Everything. the hundreds of cannabinoids. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And, yeah. Um, so just to expand on that a little bit. Uh, with most drugs out there, 
there's a minimal effective dose and there's a lethal dose. And so that's the case for opioids, it's the case for benzodiazepines, it's the case for alcohol even. With cannabis, there is no lethal dose. So if you have somebody that's on opioids and they add cannabis to the mix, this doesn't change. Nothing gets more lethal, but the minimal effective dose starts to go down. And so you actually increase the range upon which someone could get treatment, and that's how they're able to then start to cut down on the opioids or the alcohol or the benzodiazepines. And the truth is, is that this has been an exit drug forever. Now, when we first opened up our dispensary, one of the local doctors who was a prescriber for cannabis came in, and we were sitting in my office, and we were just, you know, kind of um, having a conversation, and he was watching people come in. And someone walks in the door, and he goes, that's a rec user. That's, that means an adult use user. That means not medical, even though they've gotten approval to use it in Maryland. And then someone else walks in and goes, that's a rec user. That's a rec user. So what he was doing was he was thin slicing. He was seeing somebody and saying, hey, you know, obviously that's not a sick person. And it was really interesting to me, two things. Number one is that I realized I had that same bias. And I thought about people that were using cannabis uh, recreationally as not a good thing. And it also occurred to me, it's like turning a key, and it also occurred to me, wait a second, just because someone has not been prescribed cannabis and they've been using it maybe for the last 10 years or 20 years, doesn't mean they aren't using it for some really important reasons. They've been self-medicating. And so it was at that point that I came to understand that my mission was not to worry about medical versus adult use or rec or whatever, guided versus unguided. I just want people to use this medicine in a guided way. That's part of why we do the work that we do. And you know what? I felt the same way about ginkgo biloba or uh, you know, saw palmetto. That's what I did. I helped people use that in a guided way. And that's the way this should be as well. So that whole argument about adult use versus medical use just doesn't mean any, it doesn't make any sense to me. I just want people to use medicine where they know exactly what's in the medicine and that they can use it um, uh, effectively and properly. So I said that anytime you hear endo before something, it means the body makes it. Well, as it turns out, there's also some really rich sources of these cannabinoids that come from outside the body. They're called phytocannabinoids. They come from plant source. And as it turns out, the cannabis plant is a really, really rich source of that. And so when I started doing this research about three, three and a half years ago, it was said that there were 78 or 79 cannabinoids. Today, there's been over 100 that have been identified. And again, the point is, is that we're just in the infancy of this. And so you asked about THC and CBD. Well, there are a ton of different cannabinoids out there. And so here's a list of some of the ones that you will see more commonly. And that list will expand and expand uh, with products being available featuring those cannabinoids as time goes on and as we do more research. And so there's THC, which as we know, that's the one that causes euphoria. Again, that's code for medical folks saying that will get you high or may get you high. Um, and most of the strains these days that are grown are bred to have more and more THC in it. And the reason is because that's the valuable part of the crop. Whether it's in the flower that people will use, I've got some pictures of that to show you guys, although it sounds like some of you are familiar. Um, uh, or, you know, it's from processing that flower to get the THC out of it for manufactured products that that becomes more and more valuable. And I can tell you within our company, the guy who does the growing, uh, you know, who heads up the growing uh, part of things is like a master at getting strains to maximize their genetic output and we've had some strains that we've put onto the market that have been really close to 40 percent thc which is not your father's weed uh, i'll tell you that um about three and a half four three and a half years ago i get kidney stones and i got a kidney stone that was this big and i just couldn't get rid of it and uh, the doctor just wanted to keep giving me Dilaudid and I didn't like one the way it made me feel and what it, you know, the side effects, what it did to my GI tract and all that sort of stuff. And so I did what most reasonable health professionals would do in that situation. I called up my 21 year old son. I said, Griffin, bring me some weed. And he brought me a joint 
we call them pre-rolls in the medical world. And um, I smoked it, and for the first time, I got some sleep, and I'm talking about in about six weeks. The next day, I had an acupuncture treatment, and I passed that stone. And it's on a ring now, it literally was that ring. So, um, and when he gave it to me, that's when we were thinking of the story, is that when he gave it to me, he said, hey dad, this is not what you used to smoke back in college. And I said, okay, thank you. And then, and he was right. And so, you know, back in the day when we were smoking our Acapulco Gold or Maui Waui or whatever it was, you know, maybe it was 10 or 12% THC. But um, what's coming out of the um, of dispensaries and grows now is much, much more potent. And it has um, some medical effects that we use with patients that is really, really important. Some patients need that high of a dose or they can use much less of it to get the effect that they're looking for. Um, the second one in there says THC and then there's a little A after it. And so this is an important distinction to understand as well and that the cannabinoids that come in the plant are oftentimes in their acidic form. So if, we're, if you were to go out and find a plant growing somewhere and you were to analyze it, it really wouldn't have any THC in it at all. It would have THC little a, which is the acidic form. And as it turns out, the acidic forms of uh, the cannabinoids that could make you high, that could be, give you that euphoria, they don't. So THCA is non-euphoric causing, but it has some effects in the body. And it, it happens to be something that we use a lot with kids that have ADD, ADHD, or seizures, as you talked about, or autism, because we really don't need our little five-year-olds walking around high, and it is really, really effective. And so we use combinations of that as well. Um, THC is a different, uh, uh, you know, a different form of THC, THCV, and um, that actually helps the body use energy more efficiently. And right now, studies are going, are looking at that specifically to help with diabetes in people. Um, uh, CBD, you know of. CBG is one that we like to feature a lot because it happens to be really good for gut health. And so if somebody has uh, you know, uh, gut issues, whether that's related to treatment like uh, chemotherapy or, or radiation, or whether they have IBS, or whether they have um, you know, all the way to Crohn's, that whole spectrum, very, very effective at calming that stuff down. CBN is another one that we just like to feature. It's actually the breakdown product of THC. So there was a phenomenon that people would notice that if they had old weed in a drawer, they'd go back and smoke it and it wouldn't get them as high, but they'd notice they'd sleep really well. It's only about 10% as psychoactive causing as THC is, but it's really good for sleep. And so you can find products now that are combinations of THC and CBN that are really, really effective. I've got some patients that 20 year histories of using Ambien that are off of the Ambien completely from using products that have uh, CBN in it. Comments? No. Okay. Good. And I just want to congratulate you all because at this moment you all know more than probably about 90% of your doctors <laughs> about cannabis. <laughs> so. 90? <laughs> yeah. When you say cannabis, are you of sativa and hemp, or using cannabis as the umbrella? Well, we're speaking, we're speaking, when we say cannabis, we're speaking about the species, the plant species itself. And then within that, you have your subspecies of your sativas, your indicas, etc. And, and hemp. And so yeah. when we, uh, mostly in the, in the industry, when you see, when you hear someone talk about cannabis, they're talking about the cannabis that has THC. Mm -hmm. CBD, I mean, uh, hemp is sort of like a cousin, a close cousin of that. And it has CBD. And it has CBD. And it, it can have THC in it as well. It has been bred to have the THC sort of taken out because if you're using hemp to make your sandals or clothes or rope, it doesn't need to have that THC component of it. And by hybridizing it out, they've been able to make hemp derived products legal without the whole hoopla of the cannabis. We're in a state that doesn't allow sativa. Right. So THC. So to my knowledge, uh, the hemp and the, uh, the difference between hemp and sativa are, it is the THC. Right. So I would say a hemp and cannabis. Sativa is one uh, version of cannabis. There's indica that is also cannabis. And so it's, it's either hemp or cannabis. And so the, the legal part of hemp is, the, or the law says, is that you can use 
uh, cannabinoids from hemp as long as it doesn't have more than 0.3% THC. Right, and if it has more than 0.3% THC, then it's, it's considered cannabis and it's not legal, right, in, in different states. Although I will tell you that we sell a lot of hemp-derived CBD products in our, in our uh, uh, wellness center, and I, uh, because we grow and process, we have our own lab, and so I send those things down to the lab to test them, and some very well-known products have more THC than they should have in them, which is important to know because in certain situations, that could, you know, cause someone to get you for it. A lot of people use the term full spectrum, so when you guys prescribe, uh, how important do you feel it is to, to have a mix of some sort? I mean, a lot of people will look at a dispensary for something that's CBD heavy, but with a little bit of THC, that sort of thing, so how do you that? For me, the concept of full spe full spectrum is, a, you know, it's kind of a feature of cannabis that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You may hear of the entourage effect in that, you know, the cannabinoids plus the terpenes plus all the other compounds that we have yet to discover in the plant work best together. And so, you know, deriving a medicine or using the whole plant um, is what gives you that full spectrum. And what, what the reports are is that those, you know, those types of formulations um, potentially have a, a better effect, a more complete effect in the body than those that are kind of isolated and extrapolated out. Um, there's still a lot of interest in using isolates to make tailored treatment therapies. And um, Brian's company is working on certain, you know, lots of different formulations, and a lot of the companies are um, specifically tailored, you know, with individual cannabinoids. But it, it, the the kind of buzz, <laughs> no pun intended, is really, you know, favoring a whole plant and uh, you know that entourage effect. Right. And um, and part of that I think comes from, you know, the slide before where we showed CB1 and CB2. It's the short-minded of oh, that must be all that's there, so all we need is the ones that interact with them. But the truth is, is that uh, a cannabis plant can have hundreds of compounds in it. Some of them are minor amounts, but they all fit into how they work in the body. And we're going to talk about another class of, of compounds called terpenes, which also play a very important role with how these, uh, these uh, plants work in the body as well. Um, and before we move on, I just feel the need to make a little public health PSA about CBD because right now CBD is the hot sexy supplement that everybody wants and everybody's producing and you know this the, the passage of the new farm bill allowing you know throughout the states um, of these hemp derived CBD products to be distributed now freely throughout the country has created a billion dollar industry around this and everybody's trying to get in on it. So you, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen it. You go into 7-Eleven, you go into Bed Bath & Beyond, um, you go down the street and you, there's a guy with a sign saying CBD, you know, from the trunk of my car. That's not where you want to get your CBD. Um, from your car? Not from my car. <laughs> you don't know what's in the trunk of my car. Um, so you, you want to be very careful you know, it's buyer beware. As with any supplement, these are not regulated. We don't know, um, you know, what kind of testing's been done on a lot of these products. So you do have to be really careful. So do your research. You know, um, there are some very high quality companies. So if you're thinking about purchasing CBD, you know, you can do that online. You can do that in a store. I highly advise you research the company. Any reliable or reputable CBD company is going to provide you with a report, a batch report of what's in that bottle that you've bought and an analysis of the cannabinoids and also an analysis for everything we don't want in there, pesticides, fungus, you know, all kinds of contaminants. So um, protect yourselves. You know, CBD is definitely, there's a ton of interest in it and it's doing some really great things, but it's also something that's being heavily capitalized on and marketed, and so just um, make sure you're getting a good quality product. And one of the important points to understand about hemp is that it is a bioprotectant. Part of its work on this planet is to find heavy metals and other things and get them out of the soil. And so when that's the source of medicine, it has to be processed in a way to make sure that 
heavy metals, metals and pesticides and all of that stuff is taken out of it. And so the report that Carrie talked about oftentimes is called a Certificate of Analysis, COA. And you should be able to see the COA for any batch of any product. And if you can't, that should be um, you know, a little bit of a red flag that they may, they may not be doing things right. And I can also tell you that that's a slippery slope because the standards for testing these things, not the heavy metal and that kind of part, but at least the, the um, cannabinoid content is, uh, there's no standards from lab to lab. And so uh, a, a company may use one lab and then use another lab on the same product and get a bit of a different um, uh, answer to what they think is in there. And so we're still learning about that and you know standards should be coming. You had a question, sir? Yes. Um, oh, Ma'am, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, It's a good question. We'll address that a little bit in the second half, as far as the you know the benefit that the plant has gotten from the, from man and its association with man. Um, so here's an analogy: the dogs that we have today, whether they're the Newfoundlands or the Bulldogs or the Chihuahuas, are all hybrids, one way or another, of that original wolf. There are no wolves left in the cannabis world. Even though you could go someplace and they'd say this is a pure indica, it's not true. It's a maybe a heavily indica leaning hybrid, but there are no pure indicas and there are no pure sativas anymore. And you know, it doesn't matter how many times you breed your Newfoundland with other Newfoundlands or other brands, you're not going to get back to that world. And so that that um, that ship has left. Yeah. You had a question? in the state of West Virginia, you're looking at a couple years before anything happens in this state with that. But with the CBD, we do provide the certificates and everything. We do have people who have gotten all the over with the CBD, um, have reduced pain and other parts of it. But I use the analogy, and it sounds strange, but if you eat sushi, you can go to a Japanese steakhouse and get sushi, or even stop at your gas station. And that's pretty much this area. We see a lot of it, you know, popping up signs and everything. But and there is a drastic difference in CBD in this area alone. No question. I like that. And uh, I always tell people, if you steal something from me, it's at least twice stolen, and I'm going to use that line. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we know that THC reacts with CB1 and a little bit with CB2. Many of them react with the receptors one way or another. Sometimes they actually help enhance another chemical reacting with the receptor, sort of like a, hep a helper. And some of them we don't know yet, and we will. Good? Yep. All right, here comes the big brain. All right, so... Um I want to fully acknowledge that we said we wanted to avoid using the term marijuana, but um, the author of this slide <laughs> snuck it in there. Um, so this, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time, you know, moving beyond the old "this is your brain on drugs" um, visual, because you know we're we're really moving into a much more sophisticated understanding of the science behind how cannabis works in our body. So as we go back to understanding the, this couple of slides back about this diffuse network of receptors that's located throughout our entire body, there's a lot of value and we could probably talk for days about how every single individual organ system is affected. Um, but for the purposes of this lecture, what we're really, um, I wanted to spend some time focusing on is how cannabis impacts the way our brain works and specifically our moods, um, our state of mind, our ability to achieve different states of consciousness and awareness. 
and also some of the more therapeutic and soothing properties that are really helpful. And we were talking about this upstairs, and I'll circle back to one of the really interesting things that seems a little bit counterintuitive about cannabis, but um, is actually really exciting and interesting. So we want, I don't expect anyone to have a degree in neurobiology here or neuroscience, so I'm not gonna you know, belabor a lot of the, uh, you know, the big uh, terms and the words, but what we know is that we have cannabis receptors, CB receptors in key areas of our brain that do key functions in our consciousness, alertness, memory centers, and reward centers, and also in our the areas of movement in our brain. The other important area that's affected is in our spinal cord and the way our brain transmits signals that help us interpret pain and how we experience pain and how um, our brain tells our body we're experiencing pain. So there's a, a huge network and a huge um, amount of ways that cannabis can affect the brain. So when you, when you apply phytocannabinoids and activate these receptors, there's a couple of really interesting things that happen that are really beneficial to humans. One of which is we activate in the amygdala, um, which is our reward center in the brain, feelings of euphoria, relaxation, and well-being at the right dose. Um, and Brian uh, alluded to this, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, is that uh, the beneficial effects of cannabis when we're using it medically don't require enormous doses. Mo many people are achieving these beneficial effects on what we call micro doses, which is tiny, tiny fractions of uh, the dose. And so we're not seeing major intoxication, but we're still able to activate these receptors in some way. Um, so in the amygdala, a reward center, you know, if we start to feel more relaxed, we start to lower our cortisol levels and we start to think more clearly. And we're then able to think through problems, solve problems, create solutions, and then, you know, continue to achieve access to bigger ideas and kind of move things forward. So, from an evolutionary perspective, Redu being able to reduce stress and think clearly, regardless of what's happening around you, is a real evolutionary strong point. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is the area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. And you know, most of us really value having you know a, a razor sharp, crystal clear memory of everything that's ever happened, and you know we hold that in such high regard that. Um, it's, hard to it's hard to understand why this particular effect of cannabis is beneficial, which is when the receptors in the hippocampus are active, are, are reacted, um, memory is actually blocked. Uh, so we forget, we, we achieve this state of amnesia that's kind of temporary. And you know, we ask, so you might ask yourself, why would it be helpful for me to forget? Well, you know, for a number of reasons. If, if you have PTSD, for, some, for, for example, and you're just constantly reliving a traumatic experience, uh, achieving that mental relief of briefly forgetting it allows your brain to start breaking down those neural pathways that keep cycling that experience again. Another example um, is, you know, as our species is moving forward, and John alluded to this, you know, we need to, we need, to, there are things that aren't going to make sense to us anymore, and there is new information and new ways of engaging out there that are going to come into our consciousness. So, achieving a state of amnesia and kind of forgetting things that don't serve us anymore allows more space and more awareness of new ideas and new solutions and moving things forward. So um, forgetting can actually be a very therapeutic thing. Also, if you're living with chronic illness and chronic pain, that's at the front of your consciousness every single day. There's not a moment that you wake up that you're not looking for your pain, worrying about your pain, anticipating your pain, and wondering what you're gonna do about your pain. Um, so, that's why consuming cannabis, you know, again, does it, did it really take away the pain completely? It might have, but it also made you forget for that period of time about the pain so that you could be present, you could enjoy whatever you were doing, and you could participate without depressing your consciousness. 
So those are some really interesting and fascinating things about cannabis in terms of brain function. So uh, interesting point. A lot of people um, report that when they use cannabis, uh, a couple things happen. Number one, they're really present. They're in the moment. And actually, it can feel like time slows down even. And it's related to this, because what keeps us from not being present in the moment is all those memories of things. And so something happens, and instead of just looking at what happened and dealing with it, we're like, oh wait, that reminds me of what happened yesterday and Thursday and two weeks ago, and that son of a gun. And, and that's what keeps us from being present. Or we go into the future, we say, wait, this is gonna happen again tomorrow. And so this is a really important stress-reducing um, mechanism that can happen from that. Yeah, and you know, we, a lot of people don't realize that the way our brain works, you, you may have heard that it takes three weeks to build a new habit or three weeks to break an old habit. Why is that? That's because it, it takes about three weeks of repetitive stimulation to a certain area of your brain to build enough neurons to maintain that habit, activity, or thought process. So we, in order to undo it, we need to figure out how to give our brain a break from that repeated experience so that it can start to build new pathways and new experiences. And our brain can do that for as long as we're alive. So it's it's never too late. Is cannabis used at all with dementia? There's a lot of interest in terms of <coughs> cannabis and the potential use for dementia for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, I guess Everybody's big interest is, you know, can it slow it down? Can it slow dementia down? Can it even reverse what's happening? Dementia as a class of diseases really, you know, do, it doesn't account for really the wide variety of medical causes for loss of brain function. Um, so, you know, you're, if you, someone tells you the term congestive heart failure or kidney failure, you can kind of envision what that looks like. Well, what dementia really is, is a form of brain failure, but there's a number of different causes for heart failure or kidney failure, just like there's a number of different causes for brain failure. Sometimes it's related to circulation, sometimes it's related to deposits of abnormal proteins in the brain, sometimes it's from, you know, repeated strokes. And so there's just a lot of different things to consider, but the brain tissue, um, some of the early research suggests that cannabinoids can assist with regenerating brain tissue. Again, none of this has borne out in humans yet, so we've got a ways to go, but there's interest in the possibility that cannabinoids can help regenerate brain tissue. But I think what we're most interested in at the moment while we see how that plays out is just how using incorporated cannabinoids can help people feel better and live better while they're living with dementia because yeah i was just gonna say it's yeah. a, it's about quality of life yeah. and so oftentimes what comes along with dementia are depression anxiety anger sleep issues and cannabis can be very very effective at helping that the term that we use is called neuroplasticity and cannabis has been shown cannabinoids have been shown to increase neuroplasticity, meaning that, well, you know, I don't know what you were taught in medical school, we were taught in pharmacy school that once a brain cell's gone, it's gone. That's why they told us not to drink beer. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the fact is, is that that is not the case. Uh, there also is a proprietary cannabis product that will be making it to the market in the United States sometime soon, specifically geared towards Alzheimer's. And there are some clinical studies that go along with it. My mother had Alzheimer's, and she took a derivative of uh, marijuana, and it really helped my mother. She was very, while she was in the middle of the late stages, she was a very hyper person, and she couldn't sleep. And giving her um, some of the restorol really gave her a chance to sleep and to rest her body, and when she was awake, she wasn't as hyper. She was well, she had Alzheimer's a lot, but she, she was more focused and you could focus on it. My question also that I had is, you mentioned that the cannabis, if I heard you right, that the amygdala and the hippocampus are affected by the cannabis. Um, has there been any study or is there any relation to the effects of can 
cannabis and um, endomorphs. Endomorphs are also have that supposed mm -hmm. to be that same quality. Yeah, so you're referring to physiologically the endomorph the body, body habitus. <coughs> yeah, and it, this is, we'll talk about this a little later too. This goes back to the fact that the endocannabinoid system is diffusely located in every organ, so it helps regulate and balance, you know, the way our metabolism works, the way our bodies process sugar, the way our bodies use energy the way our muscles work, and our appetite and gut function. So those are ma major components in something that we hear called the metabolic syndrome, which is kind of this constellation of you know, excess body weight, uh, inability to incorporate blood sugar you know, well, so diabetes, um, and various other conditions that go along with that, like sleep apnea, and you know, difficult mobility and things like that. So there's a lot of interest in how cannabinoids and the <coughs> endocannabinoid system can help rebalance that. Is it more effective to a feeling of high energy and relief and calmness? Endomorphs, like when you, I'm, I'm talking about endomorphs. Endorphins. Are you talking about endorphins? Endorphins. Right, right. Oh, okay, all right. So um, let's see if I can go that direction. <laughs> Yeah, so endorphins, um, you know, Brian mentioned that a little earlier, that's another class of substances that our body makes um, that interacts with a different set of receptors that also relieves pain. But endorphins kind of resemble um, opioid pain medications. So that those molecules act more like opioids. Now, we're not going, you know, again, you're, you can't overdose on your own endorphins, but, um, you know, there's just a very different way that they act. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Anything to add on that? No. So I think we pretty much um, touched on the most important things here. I think it's just important to know that the THC really can impact multiple areas of the brain that control multiple ways that we perceive the world and how we interact with the world. And um, the other thing that's important to know is that the effect is actually dose dependent. And so while a little goes a long way, you know, one of the things that we are taught culturally is that more is always more. And when it comes to cannabis, that's absolutely not the case. Cannabis has something, uh, has an interaction with the body pharmacologically that we call a biphasic reaction, meaning that at different doses, it actually has different effects on the body. And after a certain point, we actually start to see opposite effects and adverse effects as we move outside our individual therapeutic dose of cannabis. So that's, this slide I thought um, was helpful because you can see the different areas that are affected, but um, you know, in, in purple underneath, you can start to see the possibilities of the interaction and experience uh, cannabis in that area the brain might have. So again, in the hippocampus, we talked about THC uh, impacting short-term memory. So our neocortex, that's really our big gray matter. That's our thinking space. So we definitely know that it impacts that. We certainly have to be careful of our judgment and our perception of the world. And you know, if you're, if you're medicating and you're feeling altered, you know, you're not gonna wanna be making major life decisions or driving or you know, anything, or, or doing work that you wanna be responsible. Or thinking that you can fly. Or thinking that you can fly, exactly. Um, and so again, the, that basal ganglia region, that's what um, Brian was referring to when he talked about the sensation of time slowing down and you know, creating more space to lower our cortisol levels. At higher doses, that can kind of turn into a, an unpleasant feeling and kind of transition us from a, a nice euphoria into a more anxious or even paranoid state. So that's why you know, more is not always better. Um, same thing with the amygdala, you know, at, at, at an appropriate dose, we're feeling relaxed, we're feeling euphoric, but if, as we move past that dose, then we're starting to overstimulate those receptors and we're moving into fearfulness and anxiety. So um, those are kind of just little tidbits to understand that you can have two possible effects. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of our grow rooms. That's Chris. He's uh, he's he's the man. 
and, uh, and so I just wanted to show you sort of where that medicine was, and someone had asked it, or maybe John had asked it, when we were interviewing uh, further. But so this is, this is one of our grow rooms. We have nine rooms that are like this. Each one can have about a thousand plants in it. The smell is incredible. <laughs> in a good way, I'll tell you. Um, before, before the dispensary was open, and we were planning for almost a year to get it open, I would sometimes go in and help with the harvest. And um, uh, I didn't realize how much that smell gets on you. And so I was working in the in the back on the harvest in the harvest, and um, you'll see that he's in a very specific gear. When uh, these, where it's a completely hygienic um, area, the um, uh, cannabis is traditionally very hard to grow without mold and yeast and that kind of stuff. And once it gets in there, it's really hard to get rid of. And so all of our workers actually have to shower when they get to work before they can go back there and work, and they have to wear scrubs like that or, or be in a, a, literally a Tyvek suit. And, um, and so I was working there and then I had a talk that I had to go do um, at a dispensary in Frederick. And so I changed my clothes and you know got in the car and drove out to Frederick and I did my talk. I got back into the car and it smelled like college. I couldn't believe how much of a smell that came from, from, from that clothes, just from that. So actually all of us that work for the company, we have letters from the company that we keep in our, um, in our dash, you know, in our, uh, our glove box in case we were to get stopped and a cop would say, hey, wait, I smell something funny. It's like, no, 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 I work. So anyway, so this is a, we're just going to get uh, some pictures that are closer and closer. So this is a nice plant that's a uh, that's a frosty nug right there. That's a, that's the flower. That's where most of the medicine is. And as we get closer and closer in it, you'll start to see that it has these little hair-like um, uh, structures. Those are called trichomes, and that's where the most of the medicine is. Now you'll see that on the leaves, they look a little frosty as well. Keep going. That's uh, even more close up. Here the here the crowd. Mm. 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 Yeah. And so this is this is a real close up of it. And so you can uh, I can look at that and tell you that that is not a mature plant yet because the cannabinoids that oil that are in those trichomes should actually be an amber color. And so this is one that's still growing and that the cannabinoids and the other con components are starting to um, get more potent within that plant as well. So I have a question for you. If I have two different strains of cannabis, and in the strain we have the exact same amount of THC and CBD and CBG or CBN or whatever, exactly the same, why is it that one of those strains can be sedating and the other strain can be uh, invigorating or energizing? It's because there's a whole other category of chemicals in there that are called terpenes. And so this is a list of some of the more common terpenes that you will see. These are what's really responsible for many of the effects that you can feel from cannabis. And uh, much, a, a ton of research is going into terpenes now and understanding that. And so, um, and you guys actually are familiar with terpenes even if you don't know it. Has anyone in here ever smelled lavender, per se? So what you're smelling is a chemical that's a terpene that's called linalool. And we know it's relaxing. That's why people drink lavender tea or they use a little lavender essential oil before they go to bed. Well, strains of cannabis that have a tendency to be relaxing, and lots of them have the term purple in them, like granddaddy perps or purple punch, they have more uh, higher amounts of linalool in it. That's why they're common. Has anybody ever gone out into the woods and you just go, and you can just breathe. What you're breathing in is another terpene that is actually nature's mo most prevalent terpene, which is called piney. And it actually is a bronchodilator. There's a physiological reason why you can breathe better, at least until the pollen gets in there and then it's like, <coughs> up. So there's a bunch of different terpenes. The, the lesson here is two things. Um, the, the more energizing terpenes are um, pinene, uh, lemony, the more calming ones are linalool, um, uh, uh, myrcene. Myrcene and humulene are really good for, uh, for sleep, I mean for, for pain. Uh, Carophylline is as well. Um, myrcene also, all of these terpenes come, can come from other things as well. Myrcene is, um, is very prevalent in mango. And myrcene helps THC cross the blood-brain barrier. 
So there is an old wives' tale that actually is a fact, and that is that if you have more mercy, you're going to get more of a head effect from the cannabis than you would otherwise. And so when we have a strain that has higher amounts of mercy, it's going to be more of a heavy hitter. That's part of why it can really be helpful for sleep, muscle relaxation, and pain. The other thing to, to keep in mind is that a plant will usually have a couple hundred different terpenes in it. It's like a thumbprint. And you cannot reproduce that. And so the purest way to use this medicine, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the second hour, the purest way, or second part, the second, the purest way to use this medicine is by using the whole plant. Uh, extracts, tinctures, uh, tablets, capsules, all of those things can be useful, but the purest way to get the most out of that plant is to use it the way nature provided. There you go. So, uh, how are we doing time this? What time this? Gotcha. So, yes, sir, question. You say use it the way nature provided. I, I think that means in your pharmacy you can't prescribe combinations of these terpenes or something for specific purposes? You, you can, but there's that thing that, that Carrie had mentioned that's called the entourage effect. And so I could, uh, there, are, there are companies that make a vape product that have a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD, and then they add little little in to make it calming. And it can be calming, but it's not the same as getting a strain that has um, linalool as prevalent and then 199 other terpenes that all may have an effect in the body. And so it's interesting because, uh, um, I don't know, if you've been into a dispensary, lots of times the people that work behind the counter are called blood tenders. I hate that term. It's certainly not medical. The people that work for me are patient care advisors and they are trained in very specific ways and they are trained to understand the whole terpene profile so that they can look at a strain, regardless of what the name is, and say, okay, yeah, this is gonna help you sleep, or this is gonna be good for your pain, or this is gonna be good for your depression. So if you were to write a prescription, you'd be doing it for a strain rather than the components. It's a slippery slope because a strain made by one company or grown by one company is not necessarily the same as another one. And even a strain grown by the same company from grow to grow can be different. There was a, a guy who did a study in Colorado and he went to six different dispensaries and he bought uh, a strain which is called Blue Dream and then they had them genetically tested and all six of them were different strains. And so we like to look at the components to be able to reasonably predict what kind of result you're going to get from it as opposed to going by the strain game. So when you're doing a COA, a COA so you're thinking of an they're not testing for terpenes? They are, but they only list uh, you know, the prevalent ones. And terpenes are, they're, they're volatile, so they, that's why you smell them so much. And so they come off the plant very quickly, and they're in much smaller amounts. And so um, we could have a strain of flour, and when it's analyzed, you could see that its total cannabinoid content may be 35%. Its total terpene content, uh, content may be 4%. And so on the label, they'll list the prevalent ones. And if you see something over 1%, that's a lot of that terpene. I just want to expand a little bit on the challenges of trying to make a recommendation about strains and why this becomes so overwhelming for patients uh, to, to navigate is because not only are there thousands of strains um, which is growing and changing every day, you know, they, they all behave differently depending on where they're grown and what their features are. But additionally, every single human body reacts differently to each different strain depending on multiple factors individually within the body, such as your pH, your own endocannabinoid system health and tone uh, and behavior. Uh, the other medications in your system, the way your liver works, and how well the enzymes are working that are breaking things down and distributing them. So every single one of us, if, if we gave cannabis the same strain to this entire front row and everybody consumed the same strain, you'd all have a different effect. Um, so it's very hard to predict. You know, we kind of, we started off with our, our best estimate you know, in a safe dosing range, but it's it's a lot of trial and error, and people can get very frustrated um, trying to experiment between different strains without enough guidance and without enough understanding of why 
why it takes so long to maybe find the right strain right away. Or as Carrie alluded, alluded to, you know, here in America, we've got this thing that if some is good, more is better, and people end up getting into trouble because they didn't get the results that they were expecting, and then they just take more of the same thing. When I'm working with patients, I really encourage them to journal all of their experiences with it. What strain they're using, or what product they're using, what dosage, when they took it. I ask them to do a body inventory before they medicate so that they can um, sort of put an objective <laughs> number to it so say it's back pain and so before you medicate you sit down and you kind of go through it you say okay yeah right now my back pain is a seven and then you medicate and then later you say all right now it's a four that starts to give us some information where we know we're going down the right path and sometimes it's combinations of different things right cool it's the ultimate mind body medicine right. because how many of you swallow your pill and sit there and go okay I feel it, I feel it going in, I feel my blood pressure going lower. We can't, we just don't know how to make that connection. But cannabis, because it causes us to become aware and turn that awareness inward, we automatically create a connection between the mind and the body. And that's the beginning of that relationship and that gate, that's the gateway. <laughs> so. That's a good gateway. Yes. I really want to move on, but just, I'm interested in using these in my massage therapy practice. Um, and are there any instances where it's contraindicated, and particularly in the part of the so, um, all right, good question. I don't know if everybody heard it. She said she's interested in using us in, the, in her massage therapy practice. So does that mean using a topic? Okay, so um, we've been down this road because we have massage therapists that work at our center as well. So number one, in Maryland, a dispensary, yeah, medicine cannot be consumed at the dispensary. So even though we've got a wellness center that's not technically the dispensary, they can't do that. Number two, are you gonna massage your patients with gloves on? Because if not, then you're gonna medicate yourself as well. <laughs> and that's a significant problem because, you know, uh, if I were a massage therapist, I would wanna have hands on with gloves because it takes away the sensitivity of the work that you're doing with your patients and then you don't wanna necessarily get medicated. Our massage therapists do use CBD products topically and it's very very effective so that might be sort of a, a step a half step working with patients that are medicated can be very very helpful when they're getting a massage because muscle relaxation stress reduction all that kind of stuff and I can tell you that personally I've seen that go too far as well where I got a little bit too medicated and then I got so body sensitive that the the massage had the opposite effect and it was not relaxing at all. Yeah. And check with your professional organization because I can tell you that um, many, unfortunately throughout the country, many of these national organizations that govern you know, medical practices and practices like yours have not caught up yet. And so um, I was actually invited to speak uh, for, at a, a meeting for one of the larger national organizations and when they found out that I was going to be talking about cannabis they they made me cut that out of my presentation um, because they didn't want to appear to be endorsing it so um, protect yourself definitely make sure you understand what your licensing organization um, regulations are also So again, uh, you know, there's always, there's always the potential for someone to have an unexpected response. And so anytime, if, you, if you're working with a client or a patient that has a medical illness, you know, we already know that they're vulnerable. So um, applying, you know, whether you're applying it topically, when we apply topically, in general, it's mostly a localized absorption, but there, it does get into the bloodstream. And if, if you're not prepared for that, or there's another medication in their system, um, particularly certain medications like blood thinners or seizure medicines that require a really tight level in the bloodstream to function properly, those can be altered by the absorption of even small amounts of CBD. So you do want to be careful. You know, it's acting as medicine and it's in the body you know, in the sandbox with all the other medicines, the body has to process it just like the others. So medication interactions is a big deal. Um, Cannabinoids are cleared in the liver by the family of enzymes called the cytochrome P450 that are responsible for clearing about 70% of pharmaceuticals. 
So if somebody were to get a big load of a cannabinoid and their liver had to clear that, it potentially could not clear the other medicine as much, which would then cause an overdose of certain medicines. And so blood thinners, seizure meds, certain, um, certain uh, antivirals, you have to be really careful about that because you could put somebody in chemotherapy as well, yeah. right? Because when we give someone chemotherapy, we're kind of we're kind of dangling right on the edge of toxicity, right? We want to be toxic enough to kill the cancer cells and hopefully not kill too many of the, the cells. And I have had one patient that used what I thought was a moderate dose of cannabinoids and had an instant reaction because of her chemotherapy. Thank you. Yeah. I think, um, in my experience, reading it still sort of experimental um, stage about what works and what doesn't work. Um, never drop articles where parents have had wanted to give their children um, marijuana and they've had to try different marijuanas until they found the right mm -hmm. combination and the right form. At first they were tested on themselves and mm -hmm. eventually this one lady came up to what's called like a black Russian or something like that marijuana and um, she gave it to her child who was autistic and he could focus enough to ride a bicycle. Mm. And, and then, you know, there's lots of stories about it stopping seizures and all. Yeah, yeah I, have, I have some autistic patients that were nonverbal who are now verbal because of this medicine. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal when it comes to quality of life. All right, who's, ex who's ready to have oh, one more question before we do this? How's Thank you. Um, I want to circle back to your uh, best use is using a whole plant. So, which is particularly um, topical and timely given the whole big thing, which I hope you'll talk a little bit about. We will. Okay. So, what is the best way to use the whole plant? Are you talking about smoking it, cooking it, what? All of the above. <laughs> you could consume it, you know, uh, in an edible. You could smoke it. You could vape the flower. That's the, and we'll talk about that when we talk about vaping. And I, my, my personal belief is that actually vaporizing the flower is the safest, purest way to use this medicine to get the whole medicine. And there are some people that that's just not appropriate for, whether it's because of pre-existing lung issues or because, you know, they've got kids in the house and they can't have the smell or whatever. And so there are a ton of other products, capsules, tablets, tinctures, all of that stuff. It's just that it's hard to replicate what nature does with that, with that flower. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples of these. There are different kinds. There's um, go ahead. And hit it. So um, uh, so there's a, there's a couple of different kinds. And so there's a predator prey one. And so coevolution can happen when there's predators and prey. And what happens is, is that the prey will make some, uh, some physiological changes that, that allow it to be able to survive. So in this little example here, the, um, the, the mouse will uh, be able to um, uh, become faster so that it can get away from the snake. And then the snake will um, develop some sort of camouflage so that the mouse can't see it. And they go back and forth. And so that's a predator-prey kind. There's another kind where people make, where uh, different species who are competing make adaptations to be able to um, uh, to be able to thrive in a condition. And so here, a frog, you know, has adopted certain kinds of uh, color to either help with its camouflage to be able to live, and then other frogs who then become the prey, you know, make other changes to be able to survive as well. And then the third kind is, is more of a symbiotic one. And so this is where uh, there's a plant that develops a certain kind of pollen that attracts a certain kind of, of animal that can help to spread that pollen. And for the uh, animal, that's food. And so the, um, you know, the length of the flower fits perfectly with the, the, the nose of the, or the beak of the hummingbird. And, and um, that happened over time, and so that's another way to do it. And that's sort of the way it's happened with humans and cannabis as well. So this is just a sort of a little bit of a timeline of what we know about cannabis when it was used, and you can see that it goes all the way back to 8,000 you know, BC. Um, and I won't go through all the details in this. The point is, is that we're finding more and more that um, 
cannabis was used further and further back, either for medicinal purposes, for ritual purposes. Um, there's a. Uh, you, you know, And here's the reason why. So what we have, it, basically, to kind of prove coevolution, there are three things that have to be true. Number one is, is that there has to be a benefit by each species. Number two is there has to be some sort of biological adaptation. And number three is that there has to be verifiable codependence. The first two are really simple and can be easily proven, and I'll explain that to you. The third one is more uh, uh, a point of opinion right now anyways, that verifiable part of codependence and really a definition of what codependence means. So um, let's, there are lots of uses for the cannabis plant. Um, how would humans have benefited from the association with cannabis? Lots of different ways. Number one you get is uh, nourishment. So as it turns out, um, uh, hemp seeds are a rich source of nutrients. Some people have even uh, postulated that it is the perfect food for humans and also for human uh, uh, stock animals. And so hemp seed has been used as food for humans and for their animals to be able to grow. Um, grow, obviously. And this is kind of interesting, and we'll, we'll see in a map about the spread of, of uh, cannabis across the, or hemp across the, the world. But our ability to actually be able to spread this planet as a species would not have happened as quickly, as easily, or as completely if it were for hemp in that rope. So think about this. Back in the day, how did we capture those horses that ultimately became a mode of travel to increase our range? And how did we travel across the oceans using hemp, using rope, or, or the materials for the sails, and all that sort of stuff? Good, there we go. Um, so uh, clothing, um, you know, from that, uh, from that fiber. And there are examples of hemp made clothing that are over 10,000 years old. Go ahead. Uh, paper, which, um, you know, is shown over 2,000 years ago. And so think about this. That's just, okay, cool. We can make paper out of hemp. But back then, it was actually related to our ability as a species to communicate with each other and to educate it. It really is the foundation of society. Oil. So um, cannabis oil hemp oil burns brighter than other oils in oil lamps. And so it actually was um, uh, a necessity for surviving back in the day. Um, those, that's actually made out of hemp. Where do we say? Somewhere in Scandinavia? Yep. Um, and so what do we call those? Hemp? It's called hempcrete. <laughs> yep. They're building houses out of it. You're going to love this next one. Anybody here remember this? Who had one? Who had one? That actually is a fact. When did we say that was? From the 30s? Yeah, 1937. Oh, it was outlawed. Oh, it was outlawed in 1937. Yeah. So before that, Henry Ford wanted, you know, actually made a hemp car where it, the oil was used as fuel and the, um, like a hemp plastic was made to actually make the mold of the car, which was 10 times stronger than steel. That's pretty crazy, right? Okay. What happened? <laughs> Edsel happened. That's what happened. Um, okay, then there's medicine. And so, um, you know, we talked about that a little bit, and we'll kind of blow through these, these a little bit. Let me go back a second. I'm sorry. So that's okay. So that's that's a flower, and it seems like most of the crowd here are familiar with that. And so what's on the, the top there is a grinder, and so you grind that flower down, and you either um, you know, make a joint out of it, and again, in the medical world, they're not called joints, they're called pre-rolls. Um, or you smoke it, um, uh, you smoke it out of a, a, a bowl or a bong. In the medical world, those are called water pipes, not bongs. Go ahead. Um, that actually is an ancient bowl. That's about 2,500 uh, years old, and it actually 
what you would do is you would heat up the stones and then you would put the, um, the cannabis on the stones and it would, uh, and then you would inhale from that. That's a dude with short arms. <laughs> <laughs> that guy did not evolve. <laughs> um, or you can vaporize the, the uh, oil, the concentrated oil, or the flour. And, and so let's take an opportunity to talk about the whole vape thing right now if we can. And so um, what's on the bottom there is a, is a cartridge. What happens in processing is, is that you take a whole bunch of cannabis, it gets put into a canister, and then the oils are extracted from it. And so they're much more concentrated. And um, so, you know, typically a flower would be 20 to 30% THC. And a, a typical vape cartridge with the oil like that might be 70 to 85% THC. But you're using much less of it at the time, you know, uh, at a time. And what happens is that gets attached to a battery. And that battery heats the oil, it vaporizes it, and then you're inhaling the vapor. So, um, Ideally, this is actually a little bit healthier than smoking the flour because when you're burning in organic matter, you're creating carcinogens. Now, I want to I want to clarify this. There have been studies that have been done where they they compared chronic cannabis smokers to non-smokers, and they see like amounts of lung cancer, throat cancer. So you are creating some carcinogens anytime you burn in organic matter, but. With cannabis, you're also giving yourself a boost to your immune system, and it seems like the net result is about the same. However, if you vaporize, then you're not creating carcinogens. It actually makes it a little bit healthier. So, and uh, over on the, the right-hand corner is a different vape cartridge. So it's just a different mechanism and a different kind of battery where the oil is in there and it, it vaporizes. So, recently, there have been some news reports of some deaths, I think it's five or six people, and some lung injuries, about 450 people around the country. We have no idea what's going on, and even though you see reports, uh, you know, in the Washington Post or the New York Times, they are making statements which are not necessarily based on fact. So I can tell you this is what we know. We know that it seems to be that the commonality among the vast majority of people that seem to have injuries are from black market vapes. Um, they're also talking about um, uh, tobacco vapes that people are then taking and filling with cannabis or THC oils to inhale. And that seems to be part of the issue as well. They've also postulated that maybe it's because of an additive that's put in there and they've identified one thickener which is, comes from Vitamin E is called vitamin E acetate, and that also could be a problem. There's definitely something going on. I can tell you that clinically, I've been working for patient, you know, with patients for a year and a half, and we haven't seen these issues. Some of these issues seem to be happening more recently. It could be because of the quality of the cartridge. The, the thing with the nicotine vapes is that the, um, they have a tendency to uh, sort of bring heavy metals into your body because of the vape. And all of the cartridges that I know of that are produced in Maryland, anyways, are actually porcelain, not metal. And so there's no heavy metals that come from that. And all of our vape oils are required to be tested with that. Um, that being said, there seems to be a problem. And we really can't identify what that problem is. And so I have patients who have been using vapes all along. They're consistent in using the vapes that they've been using and have no problems whatsoever. Um, I can tell you that at least for us, there are no additives. We don't, in that cartridge right there, all it has are cannabinoids and terpenes, and that's it. There's nothing else added to it. And I would tell you that if you did want to vape a concentrated oil, that would be the safest way to do it, is to make sure that there's no additives. That being said, if you really want to use this medicine to its highest advantage, my belief is, is that it's safer and better for you to vape the flower. So, in the upper left hand corner are a bunch of different implements that are flower vaporizers. And they, uh, they can range from $100 up to six or $700 for that tabletop volcano model. And it, it's got an oven in it, a porcelain oven, and the flower goes in there and it actually vaporizes it instead of incinerates it. And so it's safer. You get the 
the highest benefit that you can from the flour and its ingredients, the terpenes and all that sort of stuff. And what's left over, that residue, you can actually use to cook to make edibles as well. So that's probably the safest way to do it. And, um, you know, and I would encourage you to, um, you know, to continue to be aware of the news. Just make sure it's reputable. So, um, you know, so Carrie uh, has a history as a pulmonologist, and we kind of looked through the literature and really couldn't come up with any definitive answers other than something's happening and we don't know what. And, you know, to be fair, again, <coughs> while, while the media, you know, certainly tries to be helpful in raising important issues, you know, there, there's a sensationalism that we need to just be mindful of. And the truth is that vaping-associated lung injury is not new. It has been in existence um, for, it been described for over a decade. Um, the question is, you know, why is it back in the news now? Yes, there's been a, you know, kind of an upsurge in cases. And so, you know, we, there's still a lot more exploration of uh, each individual case and what products they used and, you know, what patterns of lung injury were seen. So there is no, there's no, you know, smoking gun here. Again, no pun intended. Um, but, there, you know, we, we have not uh, been able to isolate a specific compound or device. Um, you know, the CDC and most of the medical organizations are advising doctors to advise patients not to vape, obviously, until this gets a little more sorted out. Uh, that's probably not as realistic as it sounds because this is how a lot of people like to take their medicine and need to take their medicine. And so the, advi the best advice as a physician that I give is, you know, don't buy anything off the street. Uh, as soon as you buy something off the street, you don't know who's touched it, who's done what to it, and what's in it. If you're buying from a dispensary and you, know, you are able to find out what's in the product, you know, keep it very simple, don't buy flavors, you know, make sure you know exactly what's in it, and your risk is probably pretty low. But the other thing is that there are plenty of other ways to consume cannabis, and so if you're at all concerned, you, know, you can avoid it. But well, you know, this cannabis Very generalizations, not based on any scientific method. Um, and, and that's what we that's what we found. Yeah, and that's what we found with these reports as well. And when I read the you know the article in the Washington Post, one and one are not adding up appropriately. But you know one and one equaling two doesn't sell as many newspapers. Sorry about your them wanting to do good comment. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, yeah. All right. Go ahead. So there are many other ways to ingest medicine. So these are, uh, are forms that would be more sublingual. So that's a tincture there that would go underneath the tongue, or those are lozenges that dissolve uh, underneath your tongue. Those get into your system probably in 15 to 20 minutes, and the effect will last a few hours as opposed to a couple hours from something that's inhaled. Um, one of the uh, things that I really like about this dosage form is that we can be very, very precise with the dosage. I can tell you that those, those tablets back there, going the other way, um, those tablets out there have five milligrams of THC in it, and I mean exactly five milligrams. That tincture will have, you know, I can tell you exactly how much THC, CBD, all that kind of stuff. So the pharmacist in me really likes that dosage form, and that's oftentimes what we start with, especially with cannabis naive patients. <laughs> and then there's consumables. We don't call them edibles because in Maryland, Really, edibles aren't allowed yet, so even though we've got cookies and brownies there, you can't find them in Maryland. But what you can find are elixirs, you can find gummies, those are called chewable trochies, which is an old pharmacy term for a lozenge. We make medical chews as well, and so there are capsules and tablets. The benefit of, of ingesting medicine this way is that, although it can take an hour, an hour and a half to feel the effect, the effect can last 6, 8, 10, sometimes even 12 hours. So for chronic pain, for sleep issues, this is a really popular way, and I can tell you that most of my patients that we've gotten off of opioids are using some sort of ingestible. Are these made in the U.S.? Say again? Are they made in the U.S.? Yeah, oh yeah, Every, everything, everything that's here is made in Maryland. Oh, okay. the, the, 
the regulations are that it has to be grown, processed, it has to be tested in each at each step of the way. And so when you get a product in Maryland, being a Maryland resident and being a Maryland patient, um, there's a label on there that tells you exactly what's in it and it, it, it's, it, what's in the, it's, what's in there is what's in there. I mean, what it says on the label is what's in there. Yeah. Um, and then there's also topicals. And so there's two different ways to do that. So that little patch is a transdermal patch. Well, what that means is that it's designed to deliver through the skin into your bloodstream. So you will get a blood level from that and you know, depending on the dose of your sensitivity, you could get a head effect from that. There are also topicals like that Synergy uh, Relief Balm that is not transdermal. So that you get no blood effect from whatsoever. You get no absorption. And so that gets used for, um, for local issues. It's really good for small joint issues. It's great for skin problems like uh, eczema, psoriasis, and sunburn, very, very popular. Um, if you're a golfer, it'll take two strokes off of your game. I'll be in the back with a case. Okay. Um, okay, and so then there's the uh, spiritual exploration, higher thinking aspect that humans have benefited from this, um, uh, you know, from this plant. It, it's been um, speculated that there was heavy cannabis use during biblical times. And there's also some serious scientific speculation that, um, that cannabis was actually the catalyst to get us out of the Stone Age into the modern age because of its ability to help us think outside of the box. So here's the time to talk about it. So um, there was a study done uh, with uh, some mice. And so what they did is they're able to develop mice that have um, certain aspects or don't have certain aspects. And so they make it these knockout, they're called knockout mice because an aspect has been knocked out. And what they would do, were able to do were create mice that did not have endocannabinoid receptors. Their ECS systems were gone. And so then they, they do this uh, test, which is called a water maze, a big tub of water. And they take a, a mouse and they put it in the water and the mouse swims into the middle and he finds an island and he survives. They do that with a bunch of mice, they do that with the knockout mice, all of them find the island and they survive. Then they take the mice out, they move the island to a different part. Then they put the mice in, the regular mice, go to the old, can't find it, they go around, they find the, the uh, island and they survive. The knockout mice that don't have endocannabinoid receptors, they go to the place where they were, they can't find it, they drown. Endocannabinoid receptors play a role with our ability to adapt to the outside world. And so um, there are these terms that we use, there are blips and flips, backward looking people and forward looking people. And as a society, those of us that have endocannabinoid receptors and have them activated are forward look looking, can adapt to changes in the environment. And as John you know, spoke about in, in his uh, introduction, there's a lot of changes that are coming. And us having active, um, activated endocannabinoid receptor systems will play a very important role in our ability to actually adapt to those changes instead of just looking backwards and you know ending up perishing. Cool. Um, so how did the cannabis plant uh, benefit from us? And so this is the spread of, of cannabis throughout the world. And so it's postulated that it started in Russia, China, Afghanistan area. Um, and you can see how it spread in the times that it spread. And again, the reason that this plant benefited from its association from humans is because it's humans that caused this spread to happen because of how valuable this plant is. Uh, it, most people believe that this was really the first subject of agriculture and that because those seeds were so important as food, as oil, all those things, anywhere that man went, took that plant with him. So, um, the, the fossil record for plants is sometimes a little bit troublesome, but it's postulated that the first time that we've seen cannabis on this planet was 65 million years ago. And it seems like a long time, but for it to have spread to every corner of the globe in that period of time, that's actually a short period of time for that to happen. And the reason that happened is because of its association with man. Thank you. Um, go ahead. That's a plant. Go, go back. I'm sorry. 
that's okay. Um, so uh, number two, how about that biological adaptation? And so with humans, the endocannabinoid system showed up about 600 million years ago. It wasn't until much later that cannabis showed up with the phytocannabinoids. So how did man benefit from that? Well, again, if we couldn't activate our own ECS system or create enough of those endocannabinoids, now we had an outside source to be able to, um, to uh, do that. And then the other thing that we find kind of interesting, I don't know if you want to speak to that, you can hit the next one, is we also seem to have ingrained in us this um, altered state seeking. You know, everybody remembers when we were two years old and we were just spinning around until we were dizzy and fell. And it seems to be a common issue. So we, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Any yeah. comments about that? Well, you know, initially it seems like people, uh, we seek this out for pleasure. You know, that it, and to some of us, it feels it feels good to experience an altered state of consciousness. And some people can really, uh, some species, in fact, can even engage in that. And really you know, deepen it uh, to the point where they're connecting with higher wisdom and <laughs> connecting with ideas and creativity. So, you know, what starts out as something that feels pleasurable actually, you know, involves bringing, bringing people together, bringing thinkers together. You know, many of the great, the cultural centers of our society, including music and art and you know, things like that, or there's always cannabis involved. And, and so somehow, you know, seeking these altered states sets off a cascade of events that ultimately can end up advancing our society. And we've seen that borne out, you know, over some generations. Cool. So as far as biological adaptation, how did the plant benefit from its association with man? Well, that has to go to the harvesting. Um, We've, uh, we've created plants that uh, have improved hardiness, that uh, have increased potency, um, have increased fiber strength, depending on what we're looking for. And like the question that we had gotten earlier about the different strains and the hybridization of that. That all happened from man to cannabis's benefit because that gives it diversity in being able to survive when things change. And the truth is, is that, um, uh, cannabis is pretty hardy. It's called a weed. It's called weed for a reason. And uh, but the 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 differences that we see now between hemp and cannabis and THC contents and all that kind of stuff. That's all um, done from man's perspective by man that actually benefited the plant, right? And cannabis, you know, was never made to be grown indoors yet. Uh, in, in the last decades now, cannabis thrives and is mostly grown indoors, at least in a lot of our settings. So it was able to adapt because of man. I can't remember where I was. <laughs> Just a cool picture. Hemp, hemp plastic. Oh, that's hemp plastic, right. Yeah. Again, another, another piece. Right. Okay, so the, the third thing is about, uh, previously, the third thing is about verifiable codependence. And that's where at least in theory, from a scientific perspective, certain people would say, no, you can't prove codependence. And, you know, for me, uh, it depends on how you're determining that or how you're um, deciding what dependence is and, and, and your definition of that. And so, um, to me, I don't think there's any question that as a, as a species, we've advanced because of our, um, our experience with cannabis. And if you, I mean, the examples of people that have been shown to have used cannabis just goes back forever. Um, again, I talked about biblical times and there are thoughts that the anointing oil actually was hemp oil. Um, uh, uh, Shakespeare, his, um, uh, you know, his pipes have been analyzed and they have THC residue in it. Um, uh, um, Einstein was a, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln was a, a hemp chewer. And so it just seems to be that a lot of people within our uh, history who were seen to be the really forward-thinking people, one way or another, were influenced by cannabis. So, right. And 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 then I wanted to just talk a little bit about the result of prohibition because um, we've gone through an 80 or 90-year period now that. Um, uh, 
where we haven't had access to this, and I think that the effects on our health have been really, really important. So, of course, um, I definitely know that the weird orgies and the wild parties were kind of what I was looking for with the cannabis. But this is the kind of propaganda that sort of came out with the whole reaper madness thing. And uh, there's another article that I think this was from the 20s. The vilification of cannabis in this country was political. It had nothing to do with its supposed ill effects. When the government in the 30s wanted to make it illegal, doctors from the AMA, doctors representing the AMA, went to Congress and lobbied and said, wait a second, this is an important medicine. And there's lots of theories about politically why, you know, what happened, happened. Nothing's going to change that. We're at a different time now, and that's really the important point here. Well, yes, I believe that some people can't take cannabis. Some people can't smoke cannabis. Some people can't smoke cannabis. It takes them too so, so let me, so what you said is, well, some people can't use cannabis because it makes them too. It makes them too weird. Well, it's too well, violent. Well, but that's no, not true. Well, okay. Wait, let me, let me. Let me, let me tell you why I made mean, my, we finished. Go ahead. Because I know people who personally have taken cannabis and smoke it, and they turn opposite. But let me ask you a question. What did they smoke? Pot. What did they smoke? What was in that pot? See, all of this is manageable, starting with microdoses and using much more CBD than THC would alleviate that problem. So I've had plenty of patients who have come in to me who have said, I don't want to get high. And we give them medicine that they get no impairment from. So that is not that they can't use this medicine. It's that they used the medicine the wrong way. And that's and really an important that distinction. They use some of them. Right. And that's the point. Also, lots of times people will report side effects when really they're kind of the expected effects. They just didn't expect that to happen with them. And so, and you know, feeling that, that feeling can be part of that and it's completely manageable when the medicine is used in a guided way. Right? Um, so, um, What's next? So, how are we doing time? Well, so it is 3.59. Okay. And so we can, I think what we can do is maybe give two options. There's been such a really robust discussion that started here that we could continue to just have some questions and answers. I think that there's great value there. Um, I have, you know, we also had another kind of guided imagery journey to take you on, but, um, you know, we're, I'm willing to forego that if, if you're feeling that the discussion is more beneficial. And I know there's probably a lot of questions and I want to be mindful of time because um, we are running really short, so. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, she was just asking about some um, patient, you know, st stories, so experiences. Um, so uh, a few of the more profound uh, experiences I've had, and I just, I really, you know, uh, want to emphasize that right now I'm not, I'm not giving medical advice. I'm not, you know, I'm sharing stories. I'm, I'm not promising, you know, that someone will have the same experience, but. Um, in our hospice unit, where you know the folks uh, who are terminally ill come to us who have the most severe symptoms, um, those are the ones that are often the most challenging to manage, and, and the tools that we have to use in that setting are often you know fraught with lots of side effects. So our higher dose op opioid medications, our drips, you know our sedatives. All of, the, all of the things that the human body goes through when it is preparing to shut down, um, those things can bring some really distressing symptoms. What's really unfavorable about that is that sometimes this, the side effects are worse than the actual condition itself or you know, the symptoms of the condition itself. And, and you know something that really often is troubling to people who work in hospice is that we're administering these medications, but we're 
we're kind of robbing people of time interacting with their loved ones, which is probably the most important thing. Um, time where, you know, someone can be awake and, you know, feeling comfortable and maybe feeling like eating. And so those are, those are the most severe symptoms we encounter. Things like pain, you know, vomiting and confusion. Um, so a few of the hardest conditions to treat, you know, pancreatic cancer is, is one of our most, you know, kind of feared cancers. And as it progresses, it can often bring some really serious problems. Um, lots of those people can't eat, they're very weak, they're, they're rapidly losing weight, you know, having tremendous pain, and they often end up on high doses of pain medications and kind of um, very debilitated. I had uh, at least three uh, patients who came into our hospice unit in that situation who were kind of on that track, who we decided to implement small doses of um, cannabis tincture under the tongue. So none of this was smoked um, because there's no smoking allowed in our unit. So we used all tinctures or um, some of the trochies and things that were really easy to dose. And in all three patients, we were able to avoid um, the opioid pain medications at the level that was sedating. All of those patients were able to return home for a period of time. I can't say that they lived longer or that we were trying to cure their cancer, but they all got more time and they all got more quality time. Um, they all eventually passed away, but they, you know, we were able to do that uh, with another great tool. And the other thing that comes into play with that is, is the sense of empowerment because um, using cannabis is a very patient driven process in our world right now. You know, doctors, it is, it is very true, you know, doctors right now are just not at the place where they understand how to work with it comfortably. It's very rare that you're going to get a doctor that's going to offer it um, and know what to do with it. So we have a lot of catching up to do. So our patients are forcing us to raise the bar because people are really expecting and demanding that we medically know. And now you've seen all the complexity of this plant. You know, we've, uh, doctors have got to catch up and that's how we've got to serve our patients. So um, those, are, those are some examples. I do, in my practice, I, have a, I actually love doing this so much that I opened a practice. So I have, um, we have a couple of patients in common and, and probably one of our favorites is um, a, a boy with autism who, again, was very nonverbal, um, very, uh, lots of behavioral issues and just could not settle and focus and lots of violent behavior. And uh, his mom just sent me a video of him singing ABCs. Oh. And so, yeah, I always cry. But, um, <laughs> So, you know, things like that are just, that's why. That's why it's so important for us to not be closed-minded and not, as a, as a medical profession, think that we have all the answers because, you know, we need to have open minds and be willing to keep learning, so. Do you have any recommendation on a resource that layperson's terms that one, we can dig deeper into what we scratch the surface here, and two, for that we can educate others Sure. So, um, on my, like online resources, or no. oh, I'm sorry. So um, he was asking um, for just resources on how to kind of further further your knowledge as we are evolving out of <laughs> the reefer madness era. Um, there are there are a few good resources out there. Um, there's actually, well, again, the name doesn't always. <laughs> Register, uh, resonate, but there's, uh, there is a site called MarijuanaDoctors.com that has a nice list of um, medical conditions and some evidence-based, you know, as the evidence is growing. Uh, good, you know, good use of language for lay people. It's not overly medicalized, but it, it's a high quality resource. So MarijuanaDoctors.com. There's also Leafly. Um, which is a, a, a very popular cannabis uh, website, which yes. has education on conditions and strains. Right. 
Um, um, yeah, there's a website called Prof of Pot, Professor of Pot, P R O F O V P O T dot com. And again, I hate the name, but his information is just fantastic. And on a quarterly basis, he puts out, um, you know, sort of a synopsis of what studies have come out in the last quarter, what they mean, how he interprets them. That's a really good resource that I think is understandable for lay people as well as, as uh, health professionals. I was taking notes. Can you do that, Mike? Uh, Prof, P R O F of pot, P-O-T, dot com. Yes, sir. Uh, probably not within the scope of your, <clears throat> of your presentation or maybe even your work, but it would seem to me that, the, I don't know, perhaps the difference between the CP and the THC is that one might open portals to other dimensional spirits and things like that. Again, address the soul or spiritual issues that might be relevant to an open portal. The way he was speaking about, you know, dark force and Those things are really hard to research. I'm oh, sorry, so repeat the question. So the question was, um, you know, what, what do we know about the cannabinoids and, you know, the uh, more spiritual dimension of energy and portals and, you know, the, the kind of interdimensional the travel and experiences and, and how we're studying that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it was just seeing to me that the THC could open portals to, uh, you know, dark force entities that might change behavior. And it's not really related to that person's physical, uh, the physical CBD. It might be related to THC and if you have a different, completely different entity acting out within that person's uh, field. So um, the, the follow-up comment is just about the types of energy, you know, darker entities, vulnerability under you know, while consuming cannabis and THC specifically. Um, you know, those or, are... Or for that matter, alcohol abuse. Yeah. Any number yeah. of things could And those are all concepts, those are all vibrational concepts and frequency concepts. And, you know, in general, it's good spiritual practice to, you know, protect yourself and check in with your energy. You know, if you're using something that's altering your perception, <clears throat> You really do want to be very clear about your intentions. You want to be mindful. You know, people people that end up in in situations that are maybe are inviting energy or experiences that are undesirable are often doing so without much mindfulness um, or you know just not or using substances that are you know they don't know what's in them or they're not they're not sure so. A lot of that can be uh, dealt with by intention and mindfulness set and setting. You know, that's a popular concept among the uh, LSD world, which is really about safety and ex the experience you're going to have. And the same thing applies in the cannabis world. You know, high THC strains can provide psychedelic level experience. And so, you do have to be mindful of that. So, you know, protect yourself, set and setting, you know your intentions. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how that could be studied or measured aside from just group experiences and individual reports, but, you know, at, at, John, at Hopkins, they do a lot of very interesting research uh, in that end, so I'm sure it's happening somewhere and we just don't know about it yet. <laughs> I I, yeah, I think I was just gonna say part of the human condition is, um, using psychoactive substances and most of the history of using them is under certain circumstances or with certain guidance. Like if you're using ayahuasca down in the, uh, you know, in the Amazon, it's, it, it's meant to be done with a, with a certain ceremony and respect and I think that's when we get into trouble when someone wants to use it to get high instead of use it as a, 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 a spiritual tool, right? And we could say the same thing with psilocybin, probably say the same thing with tobacco. And so I think when we use those substances in ways that were, um, you know, where we're not taking those protections, that's when we run the risk of more ill effects. I would assume the state of Maryland doesn't understand that. Say it again? I would assume the state of Maryland doesn't quite understand that. I, I, would, ass I would assume no state understands <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, this may be a dangerous issue. But I mean, if you're... I, I think there's... 
Okay. Yeah, I think there's the potential for that, how to measure it, how to study it, how to guard against it is, a, is just a difficulty. And, you know, personally, I'm not geared towards telling people what they have to do. I want to try to help guide them and the decisions they make are the decisions they make. Gentlemen over here. Yeah. I just want to say with the gateway drug and the other stuff, I'm a primary care provider for several correctional facilities, and I see thousands of convicted people, from misdemeanors to first degree murder. I talk to people, I get to their side of the story, whether they try to tell you a different story, but a lot of them smoke marijuana, okay? Not one of them has ever said that they progressed from marijuana to opioids or to what most of them are in there for is heroin. Okay, they got on heroin because of opioid addiction, or their friend had them try it. They have never one of them, of the thousands I've seen gone from marijuana to an opioid or heroin or anything else they're using off the street. They've never had mind-altering experiences, and most of them will tell you, "Hey, I've done marijuana for years." I smoked it, I never had any problems, I didn't drive, you know, to the excess, and they had no problem. And but yet they're in there for a criminal offense of some sort, but not for marijuana. Yeah, the the, the difficult is correlation and causation, right? How do you prove that one led to the other? Um, it, it, it's a it's a difficulty and to these are people to know. that's been on the street. I see people from Baltimore in our local regional jails and everything. You're welcome. They know. I mean, the, the ones I see usually from Baltimore are tied up into other stuff more so than your regular locals. <laughs> you had a question? Yeah, um, is bipolar on Maryland's list? And do, is there any, any information regarding how that's managed for people? Um, it's not on the list, so it, what she's referring to is that in Maryland, maybe everyone's familiar with that, but in Maryland there are seven conditions that you can be approved to use cannabis for intractable pain, uh, glaucoma, seizures, seven things. But the Maryland led, led, uh, uh, regulations also say, and anything that isn't adequately being treated by medicine. So technically, uh, getting approved for cannabis uh, for sleep issues is really against the regulations, except if you've got sleep issues and you've tried other medicines and they haven't really worked. And that's, I would say, probably more than half the people that are using cannabis are using it under those sorts of circumstances. Um, uh, that being said, I, I mean, uh, I'm curious if you have any experience with that. My experience with bipolar uh, patients is that it's very, very difficult. And that comes not just from way before even the cannabis world, just working in the herbal nutritional world, because um, you know, when they're on medicines, uh, uh, people have a tendency to feel like they're too even keel and there's no ups and downs. And finding that balance is really difficult. And when someone is in their manic phase, they feel great. And they don't need their medicines anymore because they feel great until they're up at three o'clock, you know, ordering thousands of dollars of stuff from QVC. And so it, it, it really is a, a very difficult issue. And what I find with patients like that is uh, that oftentimes what we can do is try to help them cut down on the side effects of the medicines that they're on and feel better that way. And, and that's where it becomes like quality of life instead of curing the problem. Does that make sense? And conditions like bipolar disorder, um, you know, there are a lot of conditions out there that are that are very fluid. You know, they're they don't they don't stay the same. So it's not a one size fits all when it comes to selecting a medication or a dosage. We often have to adjust the regimen as someone's condition changes or as a condition becomes unstable or a new medication is added. You know, and that again really emphasizes the need for you know a trained a provider someone at the helm who's watching over these patients and helping to guide them but it's, it's not an exclusion you know there's there are very few exclusions in terms of people who should never try cannabis um, and, you know, so it can be worked with and I think that if you're careful and someone's you know with a sense of the safety issues and knows how to work with it, it's still an option. Do you all service like just Maryland citizens? Say it again. Do you service just citizens of Maryland? Yeah, so the she asked if we just service citizens of Maryland. And so the Maryland program requires that you are a resident of Maryland. 
and you have to prove that to get registered in the state. Yeah. The, the regulations did say that they would take out-of-state patients, and um, the, the commission came up upon a problem. Well, wait, if we have an out-of-state patient that comes in here and you're not legally allowed to take this across state line, what are they going to do with their medicine? So they made it so that you have to be in the state. And I'll see out-of-state patients in my practice, but I can't certify them. So if they're from out-of-state, they can come to me for a consultation, and I can guide them and help them select products and do all of that. But the one thing they can't do if they don't live in Maryland is certify them. So they need another provider in their state, you know, um, to do that. So okay, that's that's the comp that's a little bit of a complicated piece, and it's probably outside of the scope of this discussion. But um, in Maryland, there's a two-step process to become a medical cannabis patient. One is to register with the state and obtain a patient number. The second step is to be seen by a provider, whether it's a doctor, nurse practitioner, dentist, podiatrist. Uh, the list is growing. Um, a, a provider who's registered also with the can State Cannabis Commission who then does an appropriate consultation and reviews your medical history and then certifies that you have a qualifying condition and that you are able to receive. So that's, that's what that language means. Thank you for asking. Um, so yeah, so I can only do that in my practice for people who live in Maryland right now. Um, but I, you know, there are doctors who there are more doctors every day who are kind of doing this kind of work, so hopefully encourage your doctors in your hometowns to. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a difficulty. I believe that that's a difficulty that is going to sort of wash away sometime soon. Um, you know, five years ago, there were people who literally moved from Texas to Colorado so that they could get their kid with seizures medicine. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's just a difficulty. But I knew people that live in, um, so interestingly, you say that most people here are from West Virginia, right. and yet when I ask to use cannabis, a lot of people raise their hands. So obviously there's a source of it. Well, it, and then, let's be realistic. They're not getting, many people are not getting it medically. They're buying it from Doblo. They don't know what which, it's Which I really don't recommend, exactly. but certainly I know people who visit states where they have uh, adult use right. and are getting higher quality products right. there. But it's, you know, it's important to know what the law says, which is, you know, cannabis from one state is not allowed to be brought into another state. And that's still a real barrier for, for people who really need their medicine who need to travel. So there's still a lot, there's still a lot of growth happening. But this is a kind of revolution, a healthcare revolution happening, you know, every election cycle. We're seeing just exponentially every state's coming on board, and um, I think soon enough there's going to be much greater access to this as medicine. So, so uh, what I'll recommend is let's take one more question, mm -hmm. and then um, we'll hang out at the wine and cheese thing and be available to ask questions until you guys are tired of asking them. You have one more question? No. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate all of this. And, uh,